Tonight we're going to be talking about who is the person behind the voice. Who is the person behind the voice? And thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking the time to come and, and to come and grow and learn and see what God has. Because, you know, somebody texted me today and asked me to, you know, if I was going to do something. I said, no, I have to spend the whole day. It takes me every minute of my day to get this done. So I'm grateful that God gave me this opportunity. Because the opportunity belongs not just to us, but those that will take the time to want to learn and grow thereby. So thank you for joining us. So good evening, beautiful friends. Tonight, this is going to be a great study because we're going to talk about how you're going to know and understand when you're having mental pressures. How many people have had mental pressures? Okay, so when you have a mental pressure, it causes something that's called, it causes mental torment. And my goal tonight is to get you to start to identify it so we can actually put a stop on it in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Don't you want to stop those mental pressures and torments? So, so do I. And this has always been God's goal for his children because God has a plan. And he said he's got a purpose. And his plan is to do something that we always forget that his goal is for his children to have perfect peace of mind. He don't want you to be in torment. He doesn't want you to have any problems. He wants you to walk with a perfect peace and a perfect peace of mind. And it's because once you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become adopted into the family of God. He calls you joint heirs, right? So if you're a joint heir with Christ, then you have rights. Like you know how you have rights here where you live in the United States? Well, you have citizen rights from the kingdom of heaven. Now, we all want to know how to like, study the manual because this tells you how to use your rights, right? <laughs> okay, cool. Now, I'm going to ask you a few things, and I know this might be a little like memory game for you, okay? But we in our lives, because we're like, you know, we might be looking like the age we are, but in our minds, we never forget. And we've had so many different kinds of pressures in life, right? So when we got to a certain age, because I remember when I was in kindergarten, I didn't want to go to school. Who wanted to go to kindergarten when you were little? You did? I did it. She was like, get me out of here. I was not interested. I went home crying. I lived in Kentucky. And I told my mom, damn, girls are picking on me. I don't want to go back to school. And somehow, I think they, they kind of like said, he will give you cookies if you come and you sit, sit down. And I ended up being their friends, but I hated it. I hated being peer pressured. I felt like I was being bullied. And then when you start to grow up in school, then you also get a peer pressure in life. And peer pressure just means that you're being persuaded into doing something you didn't want to do. You ever felt peer pressure before? Okay. Now, we all get peer pressured in high school even because people try to get you to start doing things and trying things that's not what you want to do though. Like you're like, I don't want to do this. But your friends are like, come on man, come try this man. What do you, you know, I want you to have the same feelings that I'm having by doing this. Or they try to pressure you into dressing like them. Like, man, you look stupid. You should have some of these boots on, right? See, the peer pressure is because all the other kids are doing it. That's why you get peer pressure in high school, right? Like, maybe you had a new friend in high school and... I'll never forget where I went to school at Truman, they had a whole set of doors and they were called smoking doors. And my new friend's like, hey man, come on, we're gonna go to the smoking doors. And they're like, are we allowed to go to the smoking doors? And they're like, yeah, nobody's out there smoking and doing things they shouldn't be doing. They're like, come on man, why don't you do it with us? And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. But it was a lot of peer pressure. Or you have a new friend and they try to get you to go partying. Go, hey, you want to go to a party with me? The next thing you know, they're drinking and they're smoking and getting you to smoke doobies. So, I'm just telling you. <laughs> what would happen to you? <laughs> what would happen to you if, 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 if this ever happened to you?
to you. Oh, come on, man. Just come on. Just take a drink, man. Take a hit of that smoke. Don't be a sissy. Right? Right? That happened to you? Happened to me. You see, even after you went home, though, you would still hear something. You would still hear a voice. You would still hear a voice. Or you would hear a different voice. Like you might hear them saying, and you're starting to wonder, what is going on with my life here? This is not who I am. And then you might hear a different voice saying this. Well, you know what? Everybody else is doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. Does that, that happen to you? Happened to me. But there's also this voice that would be constantly speaking to you to do what you were being pressured to do. And then all of a sudden it became like an inner voice. And sometimes it even became an audible voice. So loud in your head all day. Yeah, man, you need to go and do those bad things. Day and night, day and night, day and night. So, I'm trying to get you guys to come to a place where this may have happened to you. Because I remember it happening to me. So I want you, I made a couple of slides for you because I want you to take some pictures tonight of some slides that's going to get you out of this trauma that you've been in. And we need to understand where there is no, where there's a voice, guess what? There's a person behind that voice right there. There's a person behind the voice. Like if you ever see uh, Mickey Mouse and then you find out there's a voice behind Mickey Mouse, right? Somebody's doing the voiceover. Now there's no such thing. There's no such thing on this whole planet that the, there's no such thing on the planet that there's a voice, okay, without a person. Okay? So I've got to get you guys to follow me because we're going to go somewhere tonight. Okay? So the presence of a voice, it indicates something. The indication is if there's a presence of a person there. Okay? So you understand where I'm going with this? You may not see that person. You heard the person maybe before, but then the voice seemed to follow you home. <laughs> Even though you're no longer in that situation, right? Has it happened to you? Okay, good. And the voice that we hear, it comes along in really certain situations. And it starts doing this thing. And the voice starts accusing us. And it starts accusing us and then it starts to start to come up and torment our thoughts. It keeps repeating and repeating and repeating sideways, backwards, over, which way? It won't stop. It's tormenting your thoughts. And if the voice that comes to our mind, if that voice ever came to your mind, what I'm talking about, if it came into your mind and it starts to accuse us, that accusation starts to torment us, then I can tell you one thing for sure tonight. So you won't have this problem ever again, and you'll recognize who these guys are. The one thing I can prove to you is the voice is a person, and that person is Satan. Talk about an accuser, tormentor, you can't get it off your mind, it's driving you crazy. You can't sleep. You can't even go to bed. You keep having a subconscious mind. It's Satan or his demons. Keep in mind, he, this guy right here, see this guy? Satan, the devil they call him. He is called the accuser. So if you're taking noise, I'm taking noise. Yeah, it's a noisy thing. You're taking notes. The accuser, this is what he loves to do. He loves to torment you. Loves it. That's why this is an interesting study, because I, I love the fact that we're going to get down to the nitty busy, bitty, itty business. Now, listen, have you ever had 
an accusing, tormenting voice in your mind? Has it ever happened to you? Okay. Now, if there's a voice and it's pressuring you all day long, it's pushing you over the edge, it's driving you cray cray. Well, after tonight, you will know who this person is because I want you to identify from this day forward because the past is dead. It's the devil, Satan, Lucifer, or the old Shalufa, whatever you want to call it. And this is what's happening, if this has happened to you. He, right now, this very minute, he's working in your life. He's actually at work right now, tonight, in our life, if this is happening to you. Watch what it tells us in Revelation 12, verses 10. It says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God, our God, and the power of his Christ. Then, it says, for the accuser of the what? Our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You see it right there for yourself. Day and night, God's showing us, and tonight, we are not playing around anymore. Because we're going to take authority. Okay? Watch. Here he is. He's working in your life. He's here to show us who this pressure is. And he puts you in like a pressure cooker. Because if he puts you in a pressure cooker, guess what happens? You start to blow your what? Stack. You feel like you see steam coming out your ears. Because he's a thief. He truly is a thief. And Satan acts as the accuser of believers because he's out to make an attempt to discredit you before God. Did you see what those people did over there? Did you see what those people did you see what those people said? Did you see how they were following me? They didn't trust you, God? It's because he's trying to lessen God's love for you. That's what he's doing. God, well, how could you love these people right here? But I want to show you right now tonight, God is greater than our accusers. Because the devil has a lot of minions working for him. You know, to kill, still destroy you. And it goes to show us that this accuser, it says right here, it says he goes before God day and night. And he wants to remind God's children of theirs and their unworthiness of a place in God's family. That's what he wants. So how does he do that? How does he do that? He sows into your mind and into your heart. He sows doubt. You know you shouldn't go to that church anymore. You shouldn't support that ministry. You know what? It'd be more easier to just stay home and forget all about church business anyways because it doesn't mean nothing. He has to get sowing down into your mind to stop doing what God's maybe called you to do even in this ministry or to be a part of this ministry because this is where God's called you to serve. Well, let me give you some examples how the devil accuses and how this devil's going to be tormenting us. And he has tormented our minds, a lot of people's minds. And I want to show you that because I have done a lot of counseling myself and my husband has for many years. And a lot of people that I counsel, a good portion of their problem is, is they're under mental pressure. And they keep experiencing this mental torment. And the main one I've ever seen, even myself, in my own life, this is what it is, is I heard stuff like this. I heard this lie. Maybe you heard this lie. God doesn't love you. You're going to die and go to hell. You're not a Christian. You're a liar. You should just quit teaching because nobody cares anyways about God. They just come in there to try to act like they pretend to listen. You see how he's constantly trying to get up in my business? Has it happened to you before? Or you might be a person that just feels rejected and you might feel lonely. Maybe you feel like, man, I just don't know why I can't make a friend and keep one. I'm really lonely, even in my own marriage. See, 
A person that feels rejected and lonely is because the devil is trying to get up in your business because he wants to kill, steal, and destroy your mind. So, one of the things you start to think to yourself, you might even say to yourself, I wonder why this person I know in church, they seem to hear and they relate to God. They seem to have a really good life. God has a good life plan for them, but not for me. I'm a failure. I'm depressed. I don't want to be in this world anymore. I don't even know what I'm doing here anymore. <coughs> so here's Satan. Whoosh, goes before God. God, did you see what Brenda Jones said? He's always going to be accusing every one of God's children because he, he hates God. He hates God because he knows that God told him, you're going to burn everlasting. So if he hates God and he hates all that God is, which means that he actually also hates God's mercy and God's forgiveness that has been, it's been extended to all of us sinful humans. He hates that. He didn't get grace extended to him. But we get grace. And this is always coming to your mind. And it doesn't always maybe just come this way or go that way. It may come to you even through people. Like people might say something, your parents say thanks to your whole life, and you can't stop thinking about your parents saying, you're never going to make it. You're never going to have a good family. You're going to always be a loser. Or your spouse, they don't speak life. They're always speaking down to you. And they, think, they make you feel like you ain't going to amount to nothing. Satan, he wants to make Christians fear. And the fear that he wants to make you fear the most, he wants you to fear for your salvation. He wants you to think, you know what? Forget about God's love because he ain't going to love you until you die one day. But God says he is faithful to his word. God didn't come to save us and then say, Oh, well, I saved you, but since you made a blooper, I'm going to send you to hell. See, it's always a voice. It's telling you, you're done for. You're never going to get married. You're never going to be happy. And sometimes you keep saying, see if you can fill in the blank. See if you can fill in the blank. You say this all the time. Oh, man, I'm losing my you guys got it. You got it. You know what? You keep thinking about other people. Maybe, maybe, maybe your dad or your grandma or your grandfather or your aunt or your uncle. Maybe they were nuts. Okay? So your uncle or your aunt might have died in a mental hospital and it could even be a grandma that was in a mental hospital or your grandpa. And the voice keeps telling you, guess what? You're next. You're going to die like them in a crazy hospital. You're going to be filled with medication. You're never going to get out of that straitjacket. Ha, 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 ha. What a joker he is. What a liar. And here's Satan. This is what he says. Satan says, Look at your sinfulness. Look at what you don't do that you say you're going to do. Look at where you fall short from God's glory. Look where you, you're never going to be happy and you're always going to be miserable. Look! You're a sinful person. And you know what God says? You guys, just look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen? That's Hebrews 12 too. Always remember, in spite of Satan's accusations and his deceptions, God's never going to change his mind about those he's called to himself. When you got saved, he says, I don't care what anybody says. 
He wants all to be saved because he loves all of mankind. Now I know that I'm telling you right there are no words how painful, excruciating that kind of torment is on your mind and a person's mind. And there's torment that's associated even with physical pain and disease and there's symptoms of disease in a person's body. And as we know firsthand that the pain, we know firsthand, the pain that's caused by cancer, we know firsthand what it's like to experience the pain that's been caused even to our daughter that was caused, they said, by cancer. Like, like, let me ask you a question, because you guys are going to get this. How many people have had a pain? Mm, I've had a pain right here for a hot minute. In your belly, in your abdomen. How many have had that pain? Okay. So listen up. Or maybe you had a pain in your leg. Won't go away for many years. Or you had a pain in your foot. Or you have a pain in your head. Maybe the pain has caused some kind of bleeding. You have some bleeding going on too with that pain. But you know what? You're scared to go to the doctors to get the test run. You're afraid to see what the doctors report are because you're thinking if I go through with this, then they might inform me that I probably have cancer. Has this crossed your mind before? I'm only asking you because we're going to be free tonight. And you say to yourself, I'm sure that this, this pain, this pain is causing, it's caused by cancer. <laughs> but i got to tell you some news tonight. Honestly, there's very little wrong with you and the people you love. But you're just being tormented and that's why the devil's trying to be getting you to get so scared to face up to the challenge of your tormentors. He doesn't want you to face him. The devil wants to keep you fearful. And if he keeps you fearful, you're not going to face him as the tormentor of your soul, of your leg, of your belly. You're just going to keep lying the pain. So I want to check, uh, I want to show you that my husband's taught on this before, but you're not going to believe how simple this pain is in your head, in your belly, in your arm, or your life, or your family, or your children, in your home. I'm going to show you how simple your life has been. I'm going to explain it to you in a nutshell tonight. And let's take a look at a description in the Bible of a man, okay, that loved God. Do how many people love God in here? Thanks, because I love them too. And this man loved God, and he went through the same torment that I've been through with my husband, and you might be going through. But he's going to show us something. He's going to show you a very clear, like you ever had 20-20 vision? I think Aubrey has 20-20 vision. I don't. Who has 20-20 vision? You do? Oh, that's awesome. So we're going to give you a very clear, like a 20-20 vision, a very vivid, like whoosh, a vivid way for you to start having a very clear mind <laughs> as the Lord is going to give you a way of an escape through his word. And listen, I'm going to add something here. I'm talking, this is going to be always a clear, clear understanding. So here are his so simple yet very few words I'm going to read that's going to sum up for all of us here tonight that's listening. And guess what his name is? Job. His name is Job. Watch what happens to Job. Listen to what Job has to say. And this is recorded for me and you tonight because we're still on earth, right? Okay, come back to earth, guys. Okay, all right. It says in Job chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, it says, For the thing which, what does it say? I greatly feared is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come upon me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet. 
yet trouble came. Now, what Job is telling us, let me take a drink. Knock you guys out. <laughs> okay. Job says, What I've dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace. Now, I love God, but I have no peace. I have no quietness. I have no rest. I only have turmoil. That's what he's saying. And this truth has happened to countless people throughout our whole lifetime. The same thing. What I feared has come upon me. What I feared, he said, has come upon me. Well. That's a trap, folks. This word fear is a trap by the lying devil. And that fear is what opens the door to the very thing that you've been afraid of in the first place. Well, let's find out what fear is anyways. Would you like to know? Let me show you what fear is. And I say it like that because it's that stupid. Fear is only what? Right here. False. False what? Evidence, Evidence appearing fear. real. So you self-generate fear. You start to fear, right? You start to, you start to feed the fear, and then you get the big dinosaur chasing you, <laughs> and there's no dinosaur there. You fed the fear, you generated it. What is fear? It causes paranoia. Oh, I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen to me, because you heard it on the news. Come on. Oh, I start to worry. <laughs> you bite your nails off, because it happened to your neighbors. What's that say? Fear causes nervousness. And what else? And pure anxiety. <clears throat> so one of the things, one of the things that causes people to get cancer could just be a simple fact of a morbid fear of cancer. What's a morbid fear of cancer? You have a very unhealthy mind. You only listen to negative news and you only put yourself like this is going to happen to me. Your mind, your mental status is so unhealthy. You have an attitude that it's got to happen to me because it happened to my mom. You have the sick feeling that definitely, guess where that comes from? Who does it come from? Does it come from God? Who's it coming from? The devil. Now, just like one of the main factors in people, why they start to lose their minds is the fear, I'm going to lose my mind. They keep saying it. So this crackhead of devil, I call him a crackhead, he uses fear as like a, I wish I would have brought in my crowbar. <laughs> you know, a crowbar is pretty strong. You can put a crowbar into a lot of things, because I used to be a truck driver. I'd take a crowbar, stick it down into my tire, I had to change my tube, and it would pull that big, strong piece of rubber out so I could get the tube out. So the devil takes a crowbar, that's what fear is, it's a crowbar over your mind, you know, he goes like this, oh, that was easy to pop on her. Oh man, that guy is easy. I don't even have to use a crowbar, I can just use my finger now. And he brings something upon you that follows the fear. Just like Job said. You remember about Job? Does everybody know who Job is? He had all them boils come on him. He lost his family. He lost his money and everything. He was the greatest guy on the earth with the best business in the world. Probably the, made the, the greatest Baba Ganoush in the world and everything else. But he said, you know what? The fear of what I feared has come upon me. 
What I dreaded has happened to me, Job was saying. I have no peace in my mind. I have no quietness in my spirit. I have no rest. I only have turmoil. So let me ask you a question tonight. Is this your condition also? Does this describe maybe how you might have been feeling lately? Because I can tell you one thing that I've learned over the past few years since the Lord has graciously taken our daughters home. I want to show you something. If I find my peace is being disturbed on any line, I know for sure it's the enemy trying to get up in my business. Right, honey? He's trying to work so hardcore on my mind to get me in a little trick box so he can accuse me to my Heavenly Father and you ask, well, how do I know this, Miss Brenda? Because the Lord has promised you and me one thing that you'll never have to worry about ever again in your life, that you'll never have fear, you'll never have worry and fret and um, nervousness, you'll never be like, um, like in a disarray and, and walking around with anxiety and having paranoia and, and, and thinking, oh, the Lord took my daughter. No, you'll be, hey, thank you, God, for taking her when you did. But I'm going to show you how it works. This is what he says. He promised me, and he promises you tonight, if we keep our minds stayed on him, he will keep our minds in perfect peace. Don't you? Who wants perfect peace? Me too. Let's read this together. Look at that beautiful scenery. Who wants to go there? Me too. Okay, you guys, I'm going to lay right here. You can lay right here. Okay. Laying on the beach together. Okay, what's it say? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So you're saying, my mind is staying on the Lord, standing on his promises. I don't care what the doctor's saying. The doctors can tell me anything they want, but my mind's going to be in perfect peace because I'm going to claim the promises of God until I get my answer because I trust in him for everything. That's found in Isaiah 26.3. Sorry, you can't see it. So now I'm going to show you guys something. <coughs> see, when you say, you, Lord, you give perfect peace to those who are actually keeping their purpose firm because they know they're here for your glory. They're not giving up their life for nobody's going to get in their mind. Nobody's going to get in their spirit. And you say, I'm not going to let a crowbar open up my head anymore. And I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm going to trust in the Lord forever because he's always going to protect me. Amen? You guys got to come to life with me. Now, that's the first part of a remedy. Don't you like a remedy where you get a solution? This is the first part of a remedy that's going to work every single time for your mind to be in perfect peace. Because when you're in perfect peace, nothing can move or shake you. And we must recognize that there's a door, okay? A door that Satan uses and it comes to open the door and it gets in our lives and there's many doors he can come through, that's for sure. But I'm going to show you two of those huge doors that are constantly left open. And I'm going to call it a front door and a back door. And that's why we're going to shut the front door, for show, and we're going to shut the back door, right? Who wants to shut the front and back door, for show? Okay. All right, so here you go. First door is called... It's the front door. And this is the door that Satan uses. He's going to break into your mind right here. This is how he gets in your mind. This is how he takes away your peace. This is how he really works hard to take away your authority and your rulership and your dominion and your power of God that lives inside of you. And it comes in through, what's it say? Resentment and unforgiveness. This is a door that Satan uses to break in our minds. Resentment, unforgiveness. Now first, first, think. 
with yourself. You've got to first forgive yourself before you can assist in loving and forgiving somebody else. Like you took the blame or you took the drama and you didn't stand up for what was right maybe. You have to know that it's usually resentment toward others. And it's usually just so you know, it's usually somebody that's really close to you. That's the ones you resent. The devil hates when you have a friend, like this is my friend. What's up, brother? And all of a sudden, we're not getting along anymore. But when we're together, we can pray together, we can lock arms together, and we're going to build the kingdom together, right? So the devil's going to come first thing after people that's close to you to get you away from them, to get you to resent them, and to have unforgiveness in your heart. Could be a dad, could be a mother, it could be a husband or a wife, it could be a child, it could be a teenager of yours or a neighbor, it could even um, be especially a minister or a pastor or a teacher in your church. Now you really have to check your heart to see right now, do I have any negative feelings towards somebody? Okay, the second door. Watch the second door. Second door tells us, I call it the back door, that Satan, he frequently sneaks in like this. <laughs> it's called rebellion. It's rebellion. <coughs> What's rebellion? It's an attitude. Look at Here's a nice face. Here's an attitude. That's rebellion. My attitude is a rebellion towards God. Because you know what? I don't know what it is, but people love to be rebels. What is that about them people? They love to rebel. They also love to rebel towards society. They like to rebel usually towards human authority. As soon as somebody says, hey, you know, can you do this? And, and you, you know, then you say you'll do it, and then they change their mind. But I want to explain something to you, okay? People that love to listen to negative, you know, like some people like to gossip and talk about negative stuff all day. Guess what you're listening to if you're taking notes? You're listening to a false voice. It's false. What's a false voice? Sickness, ugliness, laziness. You're listening to lies. You're listening to pettiness. You're listening to naysaying. Now, if you're listening to a false voice, who is the false voice? We already recognize him. Who is it? Satan. Satan, right. Now God, guess who he's a voice of? Compassion. He's the most compassionate voice you've ever heard. A voice of compassion is always ready with a word of comfort, a word of trust, a word of encouragement, and a word of love. And they don't have, he has no hateful thoughts toward anybody. So let me show you something. When you and I speak ugliness, oh, here he comes. Sneaking in. You're giving Satan a chance to get through that back door. Let's see how it works. God's voice says it calms. The devil's voice says it obsesses. God's voice comforts. What's the devil's voice do? God always gives you a voice that will convict you, saying, you know you ain't supposed to be doing that, but what, is, what does the devil say? You dirty, rotten thief. You condemned you. God's voice, what's he do? The devil's voice, he discourages you. God's voice clarifies. The devil's voice confuses. God's voice, he leads you. The devil's voice, what's he do? God's voice reassures you. The devil's voice, he frightens you. God's voice is patient. The devil voice, he rushes you. God's voice is, is strengthening you. But the devil, he weakens you. God's voice heals you. What's the devil's voice do? Hurts. God's voice, he gives. He's a giving God. He loves to give you anything you ask for. What's the, what's the devil do? He steals what God's gave you. He steals it from you because you opened your mouth and you forgot to, you didn't praise God. You complained about what God gave you and you asked for it. What else he do? God's voice, he instills hope. What's the devil's voice do? 
He walk around like Eeyore all day, despair. God boys, he forgives. What's the devil do? God's always ready to forgive us, but the devil's never going to stop accusing you. Then, God, he induces peace. The devil, he induces stress. God's voice is kind. The devil's voice is always talking cruel to every single person he knows. God's voice is gentle, but the devil is very harsh the way he speaks. So what do we got to do? What do we got to do to hear God's voice? Remember, my sheep hear my voice. They followed me last week. You have to repent and confess where you've been given place to the devil. And that's why if you don't repent and you don't ask God to forgive you for the way you've been acting and talking and speaking like the guy on the left, you want to be the guy on the right. Otherwise, it'll never be dealt with. You're going to carry the burdens. are going to keep getting so heavy. <clears throat> now, I got some bad news for you, though. A lot of people like to do this. And you know what God told me today? Stop joking around about it. This is not a joke anymore. The devil's still going to come through and accuse us even when we act like, well, you know, I'm just joking. No, the devil still gets in that door. And we're going to shut the front door, right? And the back door. Because when you want to shut the doors, the power is in your mouth. It's called a tongue. That tongue is so strong, it either build or it's going to divide your home and destroy. See, this is called rebellion toward God. Rebellion toward God is a refusal to submit to the righteous government of God. He's a right God, righteous government of God. He has everything placed in order for us. So here's a cure-all for you. Here's a good cure-all. A cure-all is to, to, to go ahead and close those doors, is we have to close the door of resentment and unforgiveness. And that's when you have resentment. It means you have bitterness. You're still holding on to things. You felt like you was maybe treated unfairly. But we have to forgive even the person that we have a resentment against, too. You have to forgive them. And this is what else we have to do. You have to actually lay down that hatred. And the hatred is a negative emotion the, of resentment. And this negative emotion is causing bitterness, and it's calling bitterness to your bones. That's why you're sick with disease, because you're bringing the stress upon yourself. God's like, listen, quit blaming the devil. I told you, quit. Stop. Don't think that way no more. And resentment means to say, God, forgive me so I can move forward and be free and I can be blessed. Amen? Amen. Now, remember what Jesus said. Do you remember what Jesus said in the model prayer? Let's see what he said. Let's read it. You know this? This is a model prayer. A model for you to model after. It says, the Lord's Prayer says, our Father, what does it say? Lord, Lord in heaven. His name is holy. Let the kingdom come. Where? Let thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Right here. Watch this. Give us this day our daily bread. And what does it say right here? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Leave it there. Leave it there. So you're asking God as a model prayer every day. He's saying, you better get into my presence. You better find out where I'm at. I'm sitting in heaven, ruling heaven. You're here ruling earth. Okay. Bring the kingdom heaven down. All right, God. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive me for trespassing and doing wrong to other people. Also, forgive us and let, you know, them forgive me. Okay, so let's figure out what that means. Trespassing is an unforgiving spirit that needs to get right with God. You knew what was right to do, but you don't want to do it. Otherwise, he's saying, you will not get forgiveness from God. And he said, I'll turn my face against those that are doing evil. So basically what he's telling us in this model prayer is, don't be a hypocrite, is all that God's saying. Don't ask God to do something that you yourself ain't going to plan to do. See? Lord, forgive me. Bless me. And you're over here saying, but I'm going to hold on to this, you know, hatefulness and this resentment against my ex and all these people. God said, what are you talking about? What are you, you think I'm going to forgive you? I'm not going to forgive you if you're not going to do what I ask you to do. God says it's called mercy. 
Watch what happens when you have mercy on those people that have done you dirty and they've done the wall and they're saying bad things or making you feel awful. Here's what God says when you say, forgive them. It says if what? Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you what? Forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That's why you feel like you're treading water sometimes. But here's God. He's going to go the extra mile to forgive us. As we do as he's asked us to forgive. Amen? Here's God. Laying down the requirements. Laying down the requirements that he will not alter those requirements. But I want to show you something. Always remember that forgiveness is not an emotion. It's not, you know, today I feel really good and I'm going to love you, but tomorrow I might be not feeling good and I'm going to hate you. Forgiveness is a decision. You have to decide to make the decision to forgive. You come to the conclusion that God is the supreme judge. Therefore, I'm going to choose to forgive because he's going to forgive me of my trespasses. That's me saying, okay, God, all right. Ooh. Oh, no. Uh-oh. I owe this person because they did really bad to me. I owe that person because they really wronged me. I owe this person. Oh, I'm really mad at that one. I owe my ex. Oh, oh I'm going to get started. I owe, yeah, those people at church. My goodness, those people are terrible. I owe, oh my goodness, my neighbor. Oh my goodness, they don't even believe the same as me. I can't stand it. These are my I owe yous. And God's going like this. Take your IOUs. Tear them up. Here you go, God. This is for you. Woo. Hallelujah. And he tears up his IOUs. He gets you. Your clean slate. Fresh to move forward. Taking authority. Taking dominion. Being the ruler. Asking God to bless you. Bless you. Just like he did John Wesley. Look at God's going to tear him up in the first place. And that's why in the first place, that's how you close the door. Boom! Kick that door shut. Bam! Who wants to close the door? That's what I do. I want to close it. But if your problem is constantly rebelling against God, then the, the, the way to close the back door is to do one thing. I'm going to show you. This is what we've done. Submit. Write down the word submit to God totally. S-U-B-M-I-T. I'm going to submit to God Totally after tonight. No more playing games. No more holding hands with Satan and holding hands with God. <laughs> See, this is the decision of your will. Okay? This is a decision that you take your will, you let go of this guy's hand, and you act accordingly because you're ready to resolve all the judgments that have been made against you. Okay? Now, you want to resolve your issues in your mind tonight? Anybody? I do. Here it is. James 4, 7. It's clear instructions. It's actually a prescription for a healthy mind. Watch what it says right here. Therefore what? Submit. Submit to God. What does it say? Resist, Resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. What does it say? Draw Amen. near to God. He will draw near to you. Now you guys got a prescription, and that prescription is never going to go void ever again. It's going to be alive and active every day of your life. See, you, yourself, you cannot resist the devil as long as you keep resisting God. Well, God, you know, he wants me to do this, but I'm just kind of lazy about that. No. God is the only one that can give you the faith. He'll give you the strength. He gives you the grace that you need to resist the devil. So here's the devil. First thing he's going to do, he's tormenting you. And the first thing you have to do is what? The, what did I ask you to write down? Submit. You're being tormented. What are you doing? Submitting to who? God. God. God amen. You're laying down the rebellion by saying, well, I'm not going to get any better. I'm going to be the same way all my life. No. I'm going to submit. 
I'm laying down my rebellion. I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to say something. <coughs> I'm almost done. Get ready. Get ready. Who's ready for a change? Here it is. I made this for you. This is I'm going to ask you to read from your own heart and pray with your own heart if you want to have freedom tonight. Okay? Let's say it together. Heavenly Father, I submit to you. You are my creator. You are the owner of the universe and the commander of all things. Therefore, tonight, I yield to you as my authority. You are my righteous government. I submit my ways to your ways. And from now on, I will do whatever you've asked me to do. In Jesus' name, amen? That was always trying to choke me out. Can't, though. It's a liar. Now, if you said that and you meant that prayer from your own heart, guess what now? <coughs> oh! You now have a right with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that you have rights from heaven and you have the power to drive that lying devil out of your life. Hallelujah. You said it. God's going to do it now. It gets me excited. I can run out of this place. Watch Jesus. Here's Jesus. He's cool. Coming out of the wilderness. Hi, man. What's up? Yeah. Why don't you put like, uh, why don't you turn them stones right there in the bread, Jesus? Man, aren't you hungry, man? Here's Jesus. He did the same thing that you're doing right now. When the devil came to him, and here's what he answered him. Never forget this. It's Matthew 4.4. 4. And Jesus said to him, what does it say? It is, it is written. Say, it is written three times. It is written, it is written, it is written. Say it to the devil. What does it say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Who cares that you're hungry? Who cares you don't have a place to live? Who cares? I don't care because I'm going to trust God. It is written that is proof that Jesus himself, he submitted to God, not by an argument saying, why are you trying to tempt me, you freaking little cracker? Why are you trying to tell me to eat this bread, turn this stone into bread? Why are you trying to act, cause trouble? You know I've been in the wilderness for 40 days. What is your problem? Mm -mm. It wasn't by his thoughts, but he himself submitted to the word of God. You see how it works? Therefore, look, it's there for you to see tonight. Don't worry about where you got to go. God needs you to do some damage on earth before you leave this planet. Therefore, he could resist that devil. He resisted him. But if you will submit to God, that's why Jesus said he submitted to God, then you too have the right to resist the devil. It's your right. You guys getting this? Now take a picture of this and then we're going to be done. Take a picture. I promise you, if you don't take a picture, as soon as you leave here, you're going to say, man, I wish you would have took a picture. Because you're too prideful to take a picture, of church, of what's coming. Ready? Take a picture. Now, you yourself, you have kingdom citizen rights, and you're allowed tonight, right now, to say to the voices that keep coming and coming and coming and coming, keep telling you, bleh, bleh, bleh. you have a right, and this is your right. If you can read it, we're going to start here. I will not listen to those voices no more. Say, Satan... Get behind me. Say, get out of my head. Say, get out of my life. I am yielded to God. 
I belong to Jesus. You have no claims or rights over me. Come on, speak up. All the claims against me are canceled. They're settled by the death of Jesus on the cross. I now resist you and I command you to go from me. Get behind me. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon. God bless you.